May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, as uh, we've been announcing the past few weeks, this Sunday, this morning, we're beginning a three-week series called One Bread, One Cup, One Love. And it's our hope, it's our prayer that this uh, can be something we gather around as a community, these words, these images, symbols deeply rooted in our faith. And uh, I'm glad you're here this morning. So. Uh, are there any John Prine fans in the congregation this morning? All right. This might be surprising. A little bit more fan base in the 1030 service than the 8 o'clock service. Um, we, had, we had a few, but uh, I'm glad to know there's some Prine fans this morning. If you don't know who John Prine is, that's okay. I mean, kind of okay, I guess. Uh, he's one of me and Erica's favorite songwriters. Unfortunately, COVID took him away from all of us a couple of years back, but his music remains. And he has this song called Spanish Pipe Dream. And the words to the chorus are this, blow up your TV, throw away your paper, go to the country, build you a home, plant a little garden, eat a lot of peaches, try and find Jesus on your own. I cannot tell you how many times over the past decade, if not a little longer, I've wanted to blow up my TV and live out the rest of those lyrics in my life, but I can't. Now don't get me wrong, we have a garden and I can eat me a lot of peaches. We actually have a peach tree in our backyard and we yielded like 17 pounds of peaches this summer, but I can't blow up the TV. Uh, I like watching old movies and stuff with Erica and I can't throw away the paper. I like reading it from page one to the comics with a cup of coffee in the morning. But I still have this thing inside of me that wants to rid myself of all of it. Why? Because this world, this culture, this state of being in contemporary politics and religion wears me out. And before you start saying to yourself, uh-oh, here we go, preacher's getting political, where's the nearest exit? Uh, let me assure you of something that's not where this is going. And you should know something. You should know I am part of the Gen X generation. I grew up in the age of punk, rock, and grunge music. I am not pulled toward conservatism or liberalism. The darker angels of my nature, the parts of my soul I wrestle with are pulled toward disestablishment, utter lack of trust in any kind of sanctioned institution, including the church, which I know may sound odd coming from your priest on Sunday morning, but I'm learning just because you're called to something doesn't mean you don't wrestle with that something your whole life. And in the words of writer Annie Dillard, sometimes you got to ride those monsters to the deep in order to find a deeper reality. Honestly, though, can you blame me, really, though, about my distrust? We are constantly being bombarded by claims to truth and power from people and institutions that fail us over and over again. There is this ever-widening separation between many because of the constant messaging between one political party that thinks it's holier than everyone and another political party that thinks it's smarter than everyone. And their narratives and their ideas creep their way into our relationships with friends, with families, with neighbors. And you mix that in with story after story of churches covering up abuse or financial scandal or exiling people in the name of doctrine. Over the past nine years of being a priest, I can't tell you how many times I've sat across from someone in my office who is weeping and heartbroken because of what church or politics has done to them, to their friendships, to their marriages, to their families. And I am just so tired. I am 41 years old. I'm married. I have three children. 
I am a struggler. I am a questioner. I am a doubter. I have a hard time loving other people just as they are. I have a hard time loving myself just as I am. I want to grow spiritually. I want to have a relationship with God. But more than anything, I want the real. You know what I mean? The real. So I'm not standing behind this pulpit this morning as one who has arrived. I'm standing here as one who knows he needs community to find the real. And I'm naive or dumb enough to believe that I'm not alone in that. And maybe we got it in us to be the kind of community that helps one another find the real. In a culture that's just pulling us apart to a radical right or to a radical left, what if you and I, what if all of us are actually called to the radical center? What if that's the place we can encounter the real? What if that's the place we can truly encounter one another? What if that's the place we truly encounter the suffering of our world? What if that's the place we learn to die to ourselves and are resurrected to a new life, to a new way of seeing, a place where we can find Jesus, a place where we can be nurtured by our sharing one bread, one cup, and one love, because you never know where that kind of sharing might take us. The way it took the disciples and all the crowd that day this passage is commonly read as a miracle story. But what if it wasn't a miracle, at least in the way we like to think about miracles? The crowds kept following and Jesus kept welcoming them, but it turned into a long day and the sun began its slow walk down the stairs in the western wing. The disciples said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, we're all getting hungry around here. We need to send these people away because they need to get their bellies filled. Jesus said, you feed them. You feed them. But there's only like five loaves and two fish. How are we supposed to do that? And then here, I, I think they're getting a little hangry, the disciples. Y'all know what hangry is? Anybody get hangry? You're so hungry, you get angry. And, and they're getting sarcastic with Jesus because they all know he just sent them out, not supposed to take any food, not supposed to take any money with them. And then they tell Jesus, oh, unless, of course, Jesus, you want us to buy them all food. And then... Then Jesus showed them something. See, he got the whole crowd in groups of 50. He got 5,000 people in groups of 50, and he sat them down with one another. Which means this mass of people now had the opportunity to actually know one another. Hi, I, I'm from Bethany. This is my wife and kids. Uh, I'm a farmer, but been hard times lately. Well, I'm from Caesarea. My husband died last year, and I've been trying to make a go of it. I've been trying to support myself, but I'm just glad to be here. Well, we're from Capernaum. We're in textiles, and we heard about this teacher, this, this rabbi, and we just had to come and give a listen. We just had to come. Can you see it happening? It makes me wonder if we have to learn to share ourselves before we learn to share anything else. Then Jesus took the bread and a fish and he blessed and he broke them apart and he began to share those little bitty pieces with other people. And here's what I imagine happening, moving, making its way across the crowd. These groups of people, no longer strangers, will they begin to pull from their sacks little bits of bread what little food they had, scraps here, bits of fish and fruit there. They broke them apart and they began to share them with one another in their groups. And before you know it, this has made its way through the entire crowd, each group sharing the little that they thought they had, which turned out to be more than enough. See, Jesus took them from their fragmented lives, their separate lives, and he brought them to the radical center. So let me ask you, what's more miraculous, really? 
a divine parlor trick that defies the laws of physics and pulls loaves of bread out of the thin air, or empowering a huddled mass of powerless people to know one another and to share with one another. One bread, one cup, one love. The poet Naomi Shiab Nye was raised by an American mother and a Palestinian refugee father. And she lives in San Antonio. In her book, Honey Bee, she wrote a story. Wandering around the Albuquerque airport after a delayed flight, she hears an announcement over the speakers. If anyone in the vicinity of gate A4 understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, gate A4 was her own gate, so of course she went. And there she was introduced by airline staff to an older Palestinian woman weeping uncontrollably on the floor. She bent down to the woman and began to speak to her in her own language. It turned out the woman didn't understand what was happening. The woman thought her flight had been canceled entirely and she was going to miss an important medical treatment in El Paso. After explaining to the woman what actually was happening, she calmed down. Naomi then decided to call her father who spoke to the woman over the phone and they had a lovely conversation. Turned out they knew uh, about the same 10 friends that they had then the American poet said to herself, why the heck not? And she started calling some of her friends who were Palestinian poets, and they too spoke to the older woman. This all took around two hours. After a while, the old woman pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts, and began passing them out to other tri tired travelers, and not a single person declined. Everyone at the gate was covered with the same powdered sugar. The airline broke out free beverages from large coolers and two little girls from the delayed flight ran around pouring people apple juice into little paper cups and Naomi Shiab Nye ends the story with these words. And I looked around the gate of late and weary ones and thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying of confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. St. Andrews, I want to live in that world too. The shared world, where we're not apprehensive about any other person. And in a few moments, we're all going to make our way to this altar rail to receive communion, like we do every Sunday. And when we do that, we are, all of us, being pulled from the fractured edges from our little tribes, our little camps, our big opinions about things. We're being pulled from all that that this culture tries to keep us in and we are moving to the radical center where we encounter death and resurrection, where we truly encounter one another, where we get to proclaim the shared world. One way, together, we find the real one bread, one cup, one love. Amen.